it's and I'll as I said earlier, I'll let you know between uh, in the chat how long you have left, or I'll flash hands at you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Susan, and thank uh, you, uh, Resistance Books and Eric Toussaint, for inviting me to speak at this uh, Zoominar. It's uh, an apposite uh, thing to have because Eric's book, which recounts the events of uh, the Greek debt crisis and the class struggle that took place in Greece during the year of 2015, and discussed really what the uh, then left-wing uh, uh, government of Syriza under Fr Prime Minister Tsipras could do in order to carry out its program and its uh, commitment uh, on behalf of the Greek people, while faced with a, with a tremendous pressure being applied by what was then called the Troika of the European Central Bank, the IMF, and the European Union in trying to force Greece to accept uh, a very severe uh, reduction in its living standards through measures of fiscal austerity in return for bailout funds of loans and other uh, measures in which the government would then be able to survive on the basis of the existing economy. Um, and Eric goes into the question of whether this is, uh, there was no alternative but for the Greek government to accept the memorandum of Troika and so on. And as everybody probably remember, uh, the government put uh, this issue of whether they should accept the memorandum being imposed by the Troika on the Greek government to a referendum. And against all the odds, against all the pressure of the media, uh, against all the pressure of the uh, forces of uh, bureaucracy in the IMF, in uh, the European Central Bank, and in the European Union in general, and all those forces, and really uh, pressure within the Greek uh, economy and country as well from the forces of capitalism that supported the Troika, despite all that pressure and despite really a fairly lacklustre campaign on the part of the government in support of a vote of no, insofar as they supported it, there actually was a significant majority in favour of voting down this referendum by something close to 60 to 40, an unprecedented result in such a position. And so that was a moment when, in my view, where we had a situation where the government then had the mandate and the support of the people to carry out an alternative policy to that being proposed by the Troika. But of course, as we know, that did not happen. Within days, uh, the government accepted the memorandum and the consequences of, the, of that austerity. And Eric's book is really a description of all the events that lead up to that and afterwards, uh, on the part of the uh, Syriza government, in particular the finance minister, Yaris Varoufakis. Now, in order to develop some of the points that uh, Eric makes in the book, and I make in the preface uh, to the book, which uh, Eric kindly asked me to write, I'm just going to show you a few uh, graphs in the time available, um, and hopefully this will help us to uh, see a little bit more about what, what I see was happening. So here we are. Um, the first question I would ask is, does it matter what happened? Now we look back five years ago. And I think Eric says that it does, shows that it does because there are important lessons to be learned from the Greek crisis. The view now is that Syriza had no alternative. If you read the view, even amongst the left, there was no alternative for Syriza but submit to the Troika's demands. Otherwise the Greek banks would have collapsed the economy would have gone down an abyss and the Greece would have been thrown out of the European Union to fend for itself. Eric's book goes into detail to deny that narrative of there is no alternative, arguing that there was an alternative strategy that Syriza could have followed, and in particular, Toussaint singles out Varoufakis for failing to recognize or adopt this in his role. As you know, Varoufakis wrote this book, uh, which he talks about uh, were consulting with adults in the Troika and trying to negotiate with them as reasonable people. And apparently they weren't adults in the end, according to Yanis, uh, but he was hoping that they would be and see a reasonable policy. Uh, he started from the premise, for a fact, is that he had to persuade the Troika to act as adults and reach a reasonable compromise. So from the very beginning, 
he had very minimal counter proposals to the austerity measures of the Troika. As Eric explains, Varoufakis reassured his opposite numbers that the Greek government would not request any attempt to reduce the debt stock and never called into question the legality of the debt which was being demanded of Greece. And Varoufakis not only had the, said the government he represented would not want to call into question any privatizations that had already been conducted by previous governments, but even allow for the possibility of further privatizations to pay for this debt. And he told the leaders that 70% of the memorandum of understanding was acceptable. And so these adults in a room should be able to consider reaching a reasonable agreement. While the negotiations went on, the government went on paying down several billions of euros in debt between February and June, while the Troika made not a single euro available uh, to the Greek government to cover that. So the coffers of the government were emptied, principally for the benefit of the IMF. In reality, says Eric, the major strategic choice of the Sariva government, which was, was to constantly, uh, to make a choice, it tried to avoid confrontation with the Greek capitalist class, it was not simply the reason the government did not seek any popular mobilization against the Greek bourgeoisie. And uh, as a result, uh, it openly pursued policies of conciliation with them. Whilst there are an alternative strategy, Eric outlined some of the points that could be considered an alternative strategy in this book. The government could have resolutely followed the path of disregarding the European treaties and not be submit, submit to the dictates of the creditors. It could have taken the offensive against Greek capitalism, try and make them pay taxes and fines. Remember, in sectors of shipping, finance, the media and others, Nobody paid any taxes uh, amongst the Greek bourgeoisie. No wonder there were no funds available to the Greek government. And the Orthodox Church had the main control of most of the land in Greece, and yet nothing was done about to bring them at least in the level of taxation and, and bring some government revenues out of that, if not to take over some of the areas of, of land ownership which would help the economy to go forward. And there was no mobilization of the Greek population through various bodies and collective projects in order to support the government and to deal with the social humanitarian crisis uh, and to help the most vulnerable people. So uh, that alternative was there. But Eric concentrates on Yanis Varoufakis's uh, uh, memoirs about the, the discussions with the Troika. By the way, Varoufakis calls himself an erratic Marxist. And I think that in the Eric's book, it becomes clear how erratic that was. Varoufakis' view of possibilities of socialism before he was appointed finance minister, he'd never been a member of Syriza, but had been an academic. He said, it's not the environment at the moment to seek radical socialist policies. After all, instead it is the left historic duty at this particular juncture, less historic duty to stabilize capitalism, to save European capitalism from itself, and for the inane handlers of the crisis. So in other words, the Troika was stupid and we, it was the job of Varoufakis and the Syriza government to save them from their own stupidity. He'd written uh, a modest proposal, and it certainly was, uh, in order to resolve the crisis. And he was proud to say that that proposal uh, with social democrat academic Stuart Holland and his close colleague and friend, James Galbraith was did not have a whiff of Marxism in it. Um, Varoufakis saw his task as finance minister to save European capitalism from himself, so as to minimize the unnecessary human toil from this crisis. And he was in favor of uh, avoiding any move towards socialism because we're just not ready to plug the chasm that a collapsing European capitalism will open up with a functioning socialist system. Socialism, in other words, was a pipe dream, so we had to find a way of making capitalism work. More recently, only in this last year, Varoufakis was asked to look back at the events of 2015. And he said, what would I have done differently with the information I had at the time? I think I should have been far less conciliatory towards the Troika. I should have been far tougher. I should not have sought an interim agreement. I should have given them an ultimatum, a restructure of the debt, or are out of the Euro today. Well, the benefit of hindsight, maybe. Now, looking forward, I have to give you a few graphs about the state of the Greek economy since the capitulation in 2015. The top graph shows 
that the index of real GDP, which reached a level of 105 on that top graph back just before the crisis began, has dropped dramatically. The Greek economy has shrunk in GDP terms by 25%, and that little blue bar at the bottom shows how much it's shrinking during this COVID crisis now. The bottom left graph shows the tremendous drop in government expenditure, and the bottom right hand graph shows the huge rise in taxation that uh, the Greek people have had to, to suffer since 2015. And in particular, healthcare expenditure during this COVID crisis. Look at the dramatic drop in government expenditure on health since 2009. It's down near over 40% as we headed into the COVID pandemic with most sectors of that, of that health system being reduced dramatically or hardly rising any talk at all. Hospital beds per 100,000 inhabitants in Greece reduced by something like 20% as we enter the COVID period. Hardly a position to handle such a crisis. And now the Greek government could lose another 12% during this COVID crisis in the GDP and the public debt could hit in terms of percentage of GDP, more than 220%. The European Union is now offering a recovery fund, which supposedly will give something like 30 billion euros to Greece over the next period, if it is used uh, to finance public investment and to provide social support, then it may no doubt no help the economy and get it on a more sustainable path. But in fact, what these current Greek government is doing is actually using every extra money it can get out of taxation and reduction in government spending to boost the surplus on the government account and make huge savings. It's built up a significantly large uh, amount of savings now in order to provide a buffer for continuing to uh, meet the debt which the Greek government has. There's a huge stock of debt securities that now have to be met over the next few years and even despite the EU's grants, the EU's recovery and resilience, resilience facility and the other measures offered by the ECB means that the Greek uh, debt is going to rise over the next three or four years. Uh, and that means that even more money will have to be devoted towards servicing that debt and repaying it. Greece faces a huge increase in debt redemption through to 2026, something like 40 billion euros. And that will accelerate even after that as the EU starts asking for its money back. And yet the Greek government is using all its extra resources that it's got out of the population to, to service that debt and prevent external financing crisis like in 2015. 10% of GDP is being uh, salted away by the Greek government in deposits to meet uh, the debt. So this is the situation the Greek government is in, the Greek government economy is in as we go into COVID. And the lessons that we can learn from uh, Eric's book will perhaps give us an eye about how we, that Greece has not solved any of its problems. And it's now in a position where uh, it faces a serious debt crisis again over the next two or three years, uh, even if with the support, the limited support that the EU is giving it, with a higher level of debt, a lower level of growth, still 25% below where it was before the crisis. So was the policy of Syriza the right one to adopt to capitulate to the Troika, or was there an alternative? The clear picture is that Syriza is no longer with us, for one thing. We now have a right-wing conservative government in Greece, and we still have no improvement in the living standards of the vast majority of the Greek people. And as we enter yet another, the biggest slump in, in uh, the world economy since the 1930s, it's not a situation where you could argue that Greek took the right, that Greece, the Greek government took the right decision in 2015. But Neric will no doubt explain it in more detail from his book how he sees that situation. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very, very much, Michael. Uh, Eric, are you ready? Thank yes, you. Yes, I am. I Thank am you ready. so much. Can you start? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I fully agree with uh, Michael Roberts' comments. Uh, I am very thankful to Resistant Books to have decided to publish this uh, book, which is already published in Greek, 
and also in Spanish and in French. Okay, what uh, maybe to complement what uh, Michael Roberts say, uh, I would underline the question of secret diplomacy uh, as an explanation of the fiasco and as a lesson uh, to avoid secret diplomacy. It's very important for leftist forces to uh, be engaged in front of the citizenship to say very clearly, to explain very clearly what is happening in the negotiation and to open all the, to make public all the document of the negotiation. Uh, you know that Varoufakis made it public five years after the meeting of the Eurogroups. Uh, it would have been uh, fundamental, maybe not to make public the record of the meeting of the Eurogroup, but uh, to explain to the population, to the public opinion, what was happening in the negotiation in Brussels. Uh, they accepted, Tsipras and uh, Varoufakis accepted to negotiate in closed door. They accepted to sign uh, documents written by the Troika and, and saying to the people that they had themselves written these documents. And I, I gave the example in my book of what happened on the 20th of February or 22nd of February. So uh, less than one month after the election, uh, the Varoufakis accepted to sign, uh, to put his signature below a document written by Dan Constello, uh, who was a, a, a man of the European Commission and who has written the document supposed written by the Greek government in which the Greek government was saying, we will do uh, uh, different things to meet what the European Commission is and the Troika is asking us to do. Uh, so uh, we should oppose secret diplomacy and remember that uh, one of the big change imposed in other circumstances by the Bolsheviks in uh, 1917 was to make public all the document and the negotiation between the Tsarist regime and the uh, superpowers of Europe uh, during the First World War. It was a very important thing to show to the public opinion of the Russian people, but also to the European people, what was really the, the purpose of the different bourgeois government during the First World War. And I think that it is not part of the, the past. We should come back to this uh, policy to open the books and to make public all the negotiation. Uh, second point, I think that very rapidly, it was absolutely clear that the European Commission and the European Central Bank decided to launch an offensive against Cyprus government. When on the 4th of February, uh, the European Central Banks decided to stop the normal access to the liquidities for the Greek banks. It was the 4th of February, so less than 10 days after the election. 
uh, in Greece. And uh, the Varoufakis, he explained that in his book that he accepted. He, he said in his book that it was a declaration of war, but he decided to publicly accept this decision and to say uh, to Mario Draghi publicly that he was a very good guy defending the, the stability of the Eurozone. Uh, and in these circumstances, the Tsipras government had all the legitimacy to say uh, in front of this decision, unilateral decision, this provocation or this declaration of war against the Greek people, not only against us as government, but against the Greek people who voted for us, they would have had the legitimacy to uh, say, we cannot negotiate and under this condition and uh, began to ask to mobilize, uh, to ask the people to mobilize themselves, to create a big movement of solidarity at European level and to prepare very rapidly the suspension of payment because they had to pay uh, to the to begin the reimbursement to the IMF on the 12th of February. And I think they should have announced the suspensions of payment. They should have said, we will realize an audit of the debt reclaimed by the Troika to, to the Greek people. And meanwhile, we will suspend the payment and we will see uh, at the end of the audit uh, what will be exactly our decision and uh, what the negotiation with the European Union will uh, offer as possibility to come to uh, an agreement. The third point I, I want to raise, uh, okay, uh, the, on, on this suspension of payment, the unique possibility for a debtor to force the creditor to do something, to make some concession, is when the debtor suspends the payment. And if he, he didn't only suspend the payment, but is, if he said, I will analyze the legitimacy, the legality of, of the debt you are reclaiming, you take a position of power in front of the creditors. Uh, going back also to the Soviet experience, the government of the Soviet decided to suspend the payment of the Russian debt in December, 1917 and to confront the, the creditors. And uh, I demonstrate that in my book, uh, uh, that system, that it was a victory for the Soviet to confront directly. But I, I, had, I have been part of a concrete experience of suspension of payment. Uh, I, I was part of the, audit committee created by the president of FEC in 2000 and I participated to the audit commission between 2007 and 2008 and when we presented our conclusion the government of Ecuador decided to suspend the payment of the debt saying that uh, the audit showed that it was uh, illegitimate. They did that and they had the money to pay back because the, the, the price of the oil, uh, the petroleum uh, exported by Ecuador in this epoch, 2007, was very high. But they say 
we will not keep on paying uh, illegitimate debt. In the case of Greece, they should have decided the suspension of payments since the beginning because they had no money to pay uh, for the debt. Using all the money of the public coffers to pay back the IMF, more than uh, uh, six million, six billion, sorry, uh, six thousand million uh, euros to the IMF, they. Uh, 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 decided not to have the money to implement the program and to make better the life of the Greek people. The third point is that the, the program of Thessaloniki program, they were elected on the basis of this program. This program uh, clearly didn't uh, content the exit from the, Euro, the Eurozone because the Syriza leadership didn't want to convince the Greek people to, to the exit of the Eurozone. Okay, but in this program, they said very clearly that since the first day of the government, they will decide as government to uh, eliminate the memorandum of agreement, the MOU with the Troika. And they say in their program, we will uh, begin with a reconstruction plan. It was very clear the mandate they have regarding their own people. And opposing uh, to that, uh, uh, to that, uh, how do you say, uh, engagement or to that uh, compromise to the people, uh, they uh, accepted to enter in a negotiation to uh, maintain the second memorandum of understanding and they prolonged it for four months, signing an agreement on the 20th of February. Uh, it was the first betrayal of the, the own program. Um, and so uh, to, to conclude, I think that uh, leftist forces should take very clear uh, obligation in front of the people. And if they say we will uh, suppress the MOU, we will take the control of the bank, we will obtain the reduction of the majority of the stock of the debt, they should implement this program. Uh, and they, we, there is no, absolutely no, uh, justification to, to begin a negotiation contrary to the program uh, on what they have been uh, elected. Um, yes, I think I can conclude on, on that. Of course, I, I am convinced that it was really possible to take another uh, way and to be victorious. Uh, again, the Troika, and to open a new uh, political course in Europe, uh, because in Spain and in Portugal in this epoch, there was clearly a possibility of uh, a very uh, important change. Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you also, Michael. This has been uh, a very interesting discussion. Do Would comrades like to ask something or say something? Let's begin with those that have questions first. Does anyone have questions? Mike? Is there anyone besides Mike? OK, Mike. Uh, is that is the you, volume Fred? OK? OK. Volume Thank okay? you, Mike. Yep. 
Uh, it's a question about, uh, Eric's emphasised the debt question. Um, what I'd like to ask about is the currency question, um, uh, about both Michael and Eric, as to whether how much the currency formed a, and the, the euro formed a chain um, that held the Greek uh, government, to, in effect, to ransom. And was there a, 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 an alternative strategy of reverting to the drachma, as was advocated by some in Greece, um, as a means of um, tackling um, the, uh, the Troika? Uh, it's a particular question for us in Scotland today, because we are hurtling towards uh, independence um, uh, at a pace that staggers me every day. Um, and the key question that will come up in the likelihood of any independence referendum is what currency Scotland has, because Brexit is driving that. And there's a strong desire um, to realign with the EU and to join eventually to join the euro. Um, and I think there's a whole question on the left about the warnings about the nature of the euro. Um, but also there's the question of um, sterlingization, which was the previous policy, uh, i.e. alignment of, the, of any independent Scotland with uh, sterling. There's an article being published today, in fact, by Project Syndicate by Barry Eichengreen of University uh, of California at Berkeley, precisely about this question. And any um, ideas and, uh, and left arguments you can give us about the currency question in Scotland, should it become independent, I think would be quite important to the debate. Liam, would you like to, uh, could you unmute yourself, please? Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, Mike has touched on the question I was going to put because um, shortly after, well, uh, I had a conversation with uh, a comrade Oslam who was given some advice to the um, series of government around this. And I just got back from a delegation from Greece myself. And I asked, well, surely they were making plans to have an alternative currency up and ready to go in case they needed to put out of the euro. They would have commissioned, I don't know, a couple of art students to design a couple of notes at least. Absolutely no plans were made at any point to uh, either develop a new currency or return to the drachma. And that to me was a real indication of a lack of seriousness to break with the European bourgeoisie. Thank you, Liam. Does anyone, would anyone else like to speak? If not, I'll return to Eric and Michael and then we can continue. I don't see any other hands. Okay, yes, uh, Eric and Michael, would you like to respond? Oh, Anders, okay, Anders. Please, would you like to uh, speak? And also, please lower your hand as well. Okay, thank you. Were you able to address? Yes. Yeah, okay. Do you, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. A uh, little bit following up uh, sort of what were the alternatives, because what was not mentioned either by Michael or by Eric was uh, the, the overall, the 40th National and sort of the, the, the other sort of far left in, in Europe, because uh, to me, uh, before we accuse Varoufakis, we have to take a look at ourselves. And as many of us, of us remembers from, from those days, there was a very strong confusion. So uh, there was no clear statement uh, on our behalf that sort of you should, uh, uh, you should go for uh, exit of the Eurozone, which sort of implied obviously also an exit, a Brexit uh, finally. And that is of course, what is the bottom line here, and which is the point that you cannot avoid that very openly uh, preparing the, the people so that if the commission did not uh, uh, give in, you had to go for uh, Brexit. And, and that was was lacking also from our part. I mean, it was very uh, a clarity to the last uh, night actually. And then sort of in August, there was a statement from the 14th National, which is still sort of just says a lot of useful things, but doesn't sort of touch on the real thing. Should the 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 the, the government uh, have sort of just uh, already from February said if you don't give in, there will be Brexit, and I think uh, so. I will challenge both Michael and Eric on, on that point. Thank you, Anders. Um, I'm going to again. I'm going to return to Michael and to Eric to see if they would like to respond. Go ahead, Michael. Eric. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, 
It is a, the key, one of the key questions that came out during the crisis as well uh, about whether uh, the Greek Syriza government should have opted for a Grexit from the start or even uh, during the midst of the crisis that the option was to leave the European Union, leave the Euro and break from that. My view is uh, somewhat different. I don't know what Eric's is, we'll find out. But my view is somewhat different. First, we have to remember that this crisis is not a, was not a crisis of the currency of the euro. It was a crisis of capitalism. It was a global financial crash, a massive reduction in uh, the world economy, the collapse in GDP, uh, the eurozone was driven down, particularly the weaker sectors of the eurozone economies like Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, and so on. These people were in, these governments were in serious situation with the debt crisis, which is a product of the collapse of, of a GDP, but also the failure of the European Union to provide any support and transfer and a help, a fiscal help, which now they talk about in the current crisis a little bit, but they didn't then. Quite the opposite was the case that the, these, these governments, it was their fault they were in a mess, not the global capitalist crisis, and they had to sort it out. And if they were going to get any help, that they can only get it by continuing to meet the demands of the French and German banks uh, that held a lot of the Greek debt and later on to meet a whole program of austerity. So the issue for the Greek people at the time was, do they accept a program of austerity being applied by the Troika? As far as I can see, there is no poll which shows that the Greek people thought it was a good idea to leave the Euro and the European Union. On the contrary, as far as they were concerned, those were at least something that the, the Greece had got out over the last decades uh, was being in the European Union. And there was no move to come out of the euro except a small minority. So if Syriza had adopted as their main plank of a program to leave the euro, I don't think that would have had an echo amongst the Greek people. What they needed to do was oppose vehemently the austerity, oppose, uh, as uh, Erica said, to say they're, gonna, they're not going to pay these debts anymore, to mobilize the population behind that, and not just the Greek population, but also the wider European labor movement to support them. If then the Troika said, okay, well, we're just not giving you any more euros, which was, any, was happening anyway, then the government either had the alternative of trying to move to, a, 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 of taking over the major sectors of the Greek economy so they can get the resources, where sizable sections of the economy were paying no money at all. Uh, in terms of taxation or revenue to the government. There was tremendous possibilities for sucking up some of those profits and resources that were available amongst the Greek capitalist uh, sector in order to help the government to meet those targets. In the short term, they would have probably been in a credit situation, but they were anyway, and half the banks and companies were going down. Maybe in a certain situation, uh, they would be forced in that situation to consider looking for a currency would still have to be tied in some way, in my view, uh, to the euro currency. It's not a question of getting out of the currency as the main political uh, point of struggle, in my view. But if the Troika and the European Union wants to throw Greece out of the European Union because they weren't prepared to pay their debts and to meet their obligations as they saw it, then it will be clear to the Greek people who was doing throwing Greece out of the European Union, not the Greek government, but the Troika and the European governments. Actually, under the constitution, they couldn't even do that with the European Union. But leaving that aside, it was a, so two things here. The currency is not the issue that decided the crisis. Secondly, the currency should not be the main political strategic plan for a Greek government to fight the Troika with. That would be my view. I think that also applies in the case to all these other countries that are considering breaking with their uh, dominant partner, if you like, whether it's Scotland uh, and so on. That to pose the question as though it's the question of what currency we have is an incorrect, in my view, political strategy for succeeding and mobilizing the population for change. Okay, I will. Okay. Susan, I don't hear you. You might. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. I'm sorry. Thank I you. hit the wrong button. Uh, I basically agree with uh, uh, Michael. Uh, I want to explain to give arguments. Uh, personally, 
I was convinced since 2013, so two years before the election, that it will it would have been necessary to prepare the exit for from the eurozone for the Greek uh, leftist forces who wanted to be uh, elected uh, to form a government. But we uh, should recognize that uh, in the Thess Thessaloniki program, uh, there were absolutely no space for a Greek exit of the Eurozone. It was not the mandate. Of course, because uh, uh, Tsipras and Varoufakis and Papas and all the leaders didn't want to prepare the, the, the exit of the, real, the, real, the Eurozone. But they present a program, they, was, they were elected. So my point, I think we should be coherent with uh, the result in this case of, of the election is to implement the program on which the leftist forces has been elected. And so the question of the debt, the question of the control of the banks, the question of uh, putting an ad immediately to the Troika and to the memorandum of uh, understanding and uh, to implement uh, uh, social policies, restoring the minimum legal wage, the, the, the level of the pension, etc., were priorities. So, so I, I think that the Tsipras government had all the legitimacy to suspend the payment, to take the control of the banks. Four banks, Greek banks, were controlling 90% of the, of the market, bank market, uh, domestic market in Greece. And the government had the majority of the votes uh, in these banks. But with, uh, how do you say, uh, preferential uh, stocks, which gave no right to vote. So they had, they, what they would have had to do uh, is to submit to the parliament by law the decision to transform the preferential so stocks in ordinary stocks and to take the control of the bank legally because they have the mandate to do that. So doing that, it is absolutely clear they will, they would have entered immediately in a confrontation with the European Commission and the Troika. And I think that in four or five months, the situation would have been clarified clearly, and the Greek people would have been convinced by the fact, the impossibility to convince the European Commission to the necessity of, I would say, modify the program and to adopt the uh, exit solution. Because of course, the exit solution the exit option uh, was very clear. Uh, uh, be, became clear and clearer during all the process. Uh, and it was possible to exit the Eurozone. Uh, I, I explained in my book but, uh, that uh, you can use uh, Euro uh, BA, uh, the Euro uh, money, and to make a stamp on that. Yeah. And they had uh, 13, uh, thousand million, 13 billion of uh, uh, euros in the coffers of the central banks. 
So they, they would have been capable to prepare this situation. So to, to finish, uh, I would like to try to convince people like Anders uh, that you cannot simply say you should take the exit from the Eurozone. You should enter in dialogue with the population. You should convince the population. If you have a mandate as government, you should implement, put in practice your mandate. And uh, if you remember, I was speaking uh, uh, about the Soviets. The Soviet made the revolution and the Russian people made the revolution for bread, peace, and land. And the Greek people, the demands were something like that, basic demand. They could have understand the necessity of the exit from the Eurozone, uh, discovering that there were no other option at the end. And the end would, would have been very, uh, on a short time, I, 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 I'm sure that it's a timing of three to five months to come to this conclusion. And it's clear that uh, on the 5th of July, it was still the possibility to do, to do that, of course. Uh, and uh, because I explained the betrayal uh, and the capitulation of the 20th of February, but of course with the uh, mandate of the referendum of the 5th of July, it was still possible uh, to take a turn and to implement the good program. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Spiros, please, can you unmute? There you uh, go. Thank you, yes. I would uh, want to agree with uh, Eric that uh, the government in uh, February of 2015 certainly had uh, the legitimacy to control the banks, uh, suspend the payment of the debt, and uh, even create an alternative currency. But if they had uh, the legitimacy to do this in February, in July, they had not only the legitimacy, they had an obligation because the referendum that was won with 62% told them to do exactly that. Not only that, but by that time, the people who voted, the 62% who voted OHI, they knew that a quite possible result would be expulsion from the Euro. This was the central argument of all the, all the remainers, let's say. All in uh, all, all the right wing, actually, and the people, even though they knew this, they voted almost two thirds of them against. For me, it is this. This is these are facts. These are not opinions. The my opinion now is this: if you make a, a realist analysis of the series of government actions you see that uh, after they got the government, whatever the public rhetoric, they had decided to swim with the Troika current. My impression is that this was a decision already in 2013. After they get the government, their uh, policy choices in all sectors can be explained, rationally explained, with just two objectives. One, to neutralize their internal opposition because the leftists in Syriza itself had almost got the majority in the Central Committee of Syriza. So it was very precarious, the position of the group around Cypriot, and also to sell to the Greek public their capitulation. Everything they did after January can be explained in terms of these two objectives. The fact that they did not do anything to prepare a, a credible resistance line, a resistance line to the Troika, 
even the creation of the Dead Truth Committee, of course, it was the uh, initiative of uh, Joy Constantopoulos, but from their point of view, it was just a way to show to the left that they might be serious, but they refused to take any serious measure. So for me, it is necessary, as Eric said before, if you want to really change things, to have real commitments. Syriza always kept an ambiguity that in the end functioned in favor of those who had already sold out. This is my opinion, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian, please. Hi, uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Michael and Eric for their introductions. Uh, I really appreciated the way that Eric began his talk by emphasizing the question of secret diplomacy. It seems to me that this is a key political question that runs through the Greek crisis, whether we allow our leaders, even radical leaders, to conduct secret diplomacy on our behalf, or whether we rely on open democratic mass mobilization. It seems that this was a question that we even faced here in the last few years in the Labour Party, when the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, was very keen to hold on to power, and we were willing to support him in holding on to power in the Labour Party, and I think correctly so, but we also at the same time had to accept that there was a degree of secret diplomacy going on between Jeremy Corbyn and uh, other forces, left-wing forces and forces in the centre. It was a terrible lesson for us what happened in Greece. Um, and I think that Michael is right to point to the lacklustre campaign by Syriza in the first referendum campaign, because I think they genuinely thought that if they could treat the Greek people as children, and if they were the only adults in the room, then they could hope that the Greek people would, uh, would go along with them rather than refuse the uh, maneuvers of the European uh, Union. So um, I, I think uh, what, I would, what I would also like to point out is that many tunists and bureaucrats in PASOK, the old socialist party, were moving into Syriza during this period in the hope that they could put their bets on Syriza as a place where they could advance their careers. And it was a big difference between what was in that process and the, the lack of mass mobilization by Syriza in the trade unions and in the mass movements. And it's here that I would like to return to the point that Anders made from Norway. While I think it was a mistake to argue immediately that Greece should leave the European Union, and I, with the replies given by Michael and Eric on that point, I do think that the Fourth International should have been clearer in its support for our comrades in Okide Spartacus. I think it turned out that they were too quick to condemn Syriza for betraying before it had actually been betrayed. But hasn't it turned out that Okide Spartacus were correct in the final outcome of this process? Susan, can I come in? You are it. Yeah, Susan? All right. Where's Susan? Oh, maybe she had to go. I know she had to go, Susan. Right, no, she had to go. That's right. Uh, well, I'm chairing, I'm chairing, and I was going to come in and say something as well, right? 
So I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words now and, and I'll take over the chair and uh, sorry for this little confusion here. I, I agree with Eric and, and, and Michael about um, the need to call on governments, progressive, left-wing, anti-capitalist or anti-neoliberal, anti-austerity governments to implement the program on which they were elected. Uh, and the Thessaloniki program was a very radical, much more radical program than that of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, however much we were pleased to support uh, much in Jeremy Corbyn's program uh, back then, right? Um, and um, and the, the important thing about the, the, the times of 2000, well, up to leading up to 2015, which we didn't see under Jeremy Corbyn while leader of the Labour Party, was the immense popular mobilization there was in support of the Syriza government in its confrontation uh, with the EU, however much uh, Tsipras and Varoufakis were uh, 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 avoiding a confrontation. Uh, just to remind ourselves that there was something like 35 one days of general strike in Greece over a period of two years or three years, which was uh, a tremendous uh, popular mobilization. There was also numerous uh, instances of self-organization in terms of mutual aid, you know, education, health services and things like that, which um, the Greece Solidarity Campaign here in Britain, a modest initiative, which uh, I must pay tribute to Paul McNee and others like uh, uh, Manuel Cortes, launched and helped in a modest way to send, to bring over medicine and finances to some of those health clinics, self-organized cl health clinics. But it, it's just to come back to the question of democracy again. Um, I remember the, um, the, uh, the German finance minister, Wolfgang Schlauber, um, say that they were not going to change a treaty because of the outcome of an election, because of the outcome of a general election. And that's precisely why we should, you know, we should have been, uh, 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 why, why treaties can be broken, because there is a, because there is a popular mandate to change what uh, uh, illegitimate decisions, unfair decisions, uh, anti-working class decisions have been enshrined in previous treaties. And the Syriza, in my opinion, the Syriza government had, you know, the, 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 the dynamic behind it with the popular mobilization to force uh, the, gov the, the Troika to make concessions and to call their bluff. And, but on this question of, of exit, I mean, it, I agree that, you know, to initially call on Syriza to, 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 to break with the EU would have been wrong. Um, however, it would have been right, in, in my opinion, at some stage or another, to warn uh, the people and say, these are the choices in front of us, right? If we accept the Troika's terms, uh, there's, they're going to be uh, a capitalist austerity imposed on us. Um, but if we, but if they kick us out, uh, if they kick us out, then uh, and we will maintain our position in terms of the asking for cancellation of the debt and so on. And if they do kick us out, we will. There may be sacrifices to make, but it will be. Uh, we'll make the rich. Uh, uh, we'll put the sacrifices on the rich. Make the rich pay and uh, not have a, a, an anti-working class austerity. It'll be a different type of austerity. So um, we shouldn't, you know, of course we should uh, carefully argue that, you know, the strategy of Syriza was wrong uh, earlier on. And I'm, I, well, I can't remember exactly the details, but, but I think broadly speaking, I think from the debates we had in Britain, certainly, um, we were calling for the implementation of the Thessaloniki program to support the mass mobilization and to support uh, and to call on uh, uh, the uh, Syriza government to respect its mandate. And that defeat of 2015 still rings with us um, because it, you know, had they stood firm, then Podemos, then Jeremy Corbyn, even Bernie Sanders, etc., would have gone much, much further. It would have been, a, we would have been in a much better position today. Anyway. So right, I'll take Anders later because you've already spoken, Anders, but I'll take Patrick Scott now. All right. And anybody else want to come back in? Uh, Patrick and then Alan. All right. Patrick. Okay, I'd just like to sort of contribute something to make this one to digress sort of slightly from the economics. Um, 
one thing I feel is that there's never any kind of, I mean, some people may disagree who, who know more about intermediate reason, but I, the impression I get is that there's never any sort of real internationalism in, in the politics of Syriza. I think that is um, just about the same time as they were Alex Cyprus and Var Varoufakis and the rest of the government capitulating to the Troika. Theresa was doing a complete about turn on, on, its, relation, on its relations with the Israeli states. I mean, in, the, in its platform, it did take a more or less correct anti imperialist position against military co cooperation with Israel and support for Palestinian states. Yet they completely did a, a, a complete about turn on that. Another thing um, that's always interested me is there's been a, there's the whole sort of long standing Macedonian question, uh, which sort of affected Greek politics over the last so few decades. And Syriza never took a principled internationalist position in favour of the people of, of Yugoslav Macedonia to sort of, to have self determination, to determination, i.e., to determine what name they want to call themselves, to the extent that, um, again, more or less about the same time as they were capitulating. Uh, I know that Cyprus went over to the United Nations in New York, and there was a session, there was some session of the UN meeting, and he, um, he refused to attend it because Macedonia had been invited in, 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 in the name as, as the Republic of Macedonia rather than the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. So I'm just um, throwing that in a, a, as, a, as a contribution, and I'll, I'll be interested to know what, what other might think about that. Okay. Okay. There's 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 four, four people who've put their hands up. So I'd like Michael and Eric to come back now for a little for a few minutes before I take the additional speakers uh, from the floor. Michael or Eric, who do you, which one do you want to come come in first? Yeah, I would like to to say something. Do you hear me? Yeah, fine. Yes. Uh, you know I. Uh, I think it would be useful for some of you to read my book because I, 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 I gave, I am giving in the book a lot of uh, facts and arguments of uh, what is what is has been the evolution of the C plus leadership of Syriza uh, between 2012 and 2015. Uh, I am totally convinced that uh, Tsipras made the turn uh, around October, September, October 2012, and decided to adopt a strategy to avoid confrontation with the uh, capitalist Greek class uh, and uh, the European Commission. And so he had a problem uh, because uh, the program uh, of 2012 was, was very radical. Uh, and he, and he, he was looking for uh, a guy who can uh, be finance minister and he intent and succeed in uh, convincing Varoufakis who was not a member of Syriza so was not submitted to the pressure of the lefted forces inside Syriza. Uh, and Varoufakis was opposed to the program of Syriza uh, uh, with which Syriza presented itself in the election of 2012 and gain 27.5% uh, of the votes. Uh, the, the, what is complicated maybe for you to understand from outside is that to, to, to be convinced that Cyprus was opposed to the Thessaloniki program. I agree with uh, Spiros, it, it was uh, in some way a left Keynesian program, not an anti-capitalist program. 
but it was too leftist for Tsipras. And it, was, it is clear in the testimony of Varoufakis. Varoufakis, Varoufakis said publicly that he was opposed to the Thessaloniki program. And out of record, Tsipras and Papas, the alter ego of Tsipras, uh, told Varoufakis, you don't have to take into account the Thessaloniki program. We ask you to implement another program. Uh, it's complicated to understand. So it was related to the relation of forces inside Syriza. Tsipras to have the majority in Syriza had to accept the Thessaloniki program which was already less radical than the two, 2012 program, but too radical for, for his own position. So he defended the program of Thessaloniki. He was elected on the basis of the program, but immediately it was not, for him, it was not a, a, a big turn. He was prepared to, to make the turn immediately after the election to not implement the Thessaloniki program. And so for the leftist forces, it would have been important to, in this case, to defend the mandate of the program and to uh, ask for the concretization of this program, which in the uh, way of implementing the program would have entered in a direct confrontation with the European Commission uh, and led for me to the exit of the Eurozone. But mainly, I agree with uh, 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 Michael. The main question was the confrontation with the capitalist system. So to take the control of the banks, to make strategical expropriation of some tools uh, of the industry who could be useful to rebuild the, the economy of, uh, of Greece. Uh, okay, so the, the question about OKD E to the this organization which was part of uh, Antarsia and opposed to the Tsipra. I think I was in contact, of course, with them since uh, <laughs> 20 years. And they had a discussion inside the organization to decide in 2010 to support or not the the process of auditing the debt with citizen participation. And at the beginning, OKDE decided to support. And uh, rapidly, after two months, they decided to change their mind and to say, uh, we don't have to support the audit of the debt because already all the Greek population is for the full cancellation of the debt. So there is absolutely no necessity to audit the debt. And for me, it's a very uh, ultra leftist position not to understand what is really the situation of the conscious of the Greek people and uh, uh, of the proletariat, of the Greek proletariat, etc. And to be, uh, to not understand how to deal with a, a transitional uh, program and a transitional approach to help the people to gain conscious uh, through the class struggle and the, poli the, the politics uh, uh, to understand the necessity of radicalize the position. So, uh, the problem of OKDE was ultra leftism. And uh, I think that in some way, if forces like OKDE would have had 
a, a position of uh, united front with Syriza to strengthen the left part of Syriza and to put in minority, to try to put in minority the Tsipras leadership, uh, we would have had another uh, situation in Greece. And of course, there is a huge responsibility of the Kukui, the Communist Party of Greece, because they decided not to make a government with Syriza. They decided not to give the vote to a Syriza government because it would have been possible to say, as Communist Party, we don't want to be part of the government with Syriza. We stay in the opposition, but we give the, our vote to the confidence to the government. And Syriza could be a government with 149 members of the parliament on a parliament of 300. Uh, and the Communist Party would have had the possibility to negotiate with Syriza the implementation of the restoration of the minimum wage, etc. And uh, refusing to make uh, an agreement with Syriza, uh, the two, there were two options. They gave the way to the ANEL, the right wing populist uh, sovereignist party in the alliance. It, it is also the, the other leftist forces, because I consider the Communist Party of Greece as part of the left, uh, also ultra sectarian but part of the left, that there was also so a problem of the, the, the other part of the left, the left outside Syriza to adopt the good orientation in these circumstances. Great. <coughs> Thank you for Thank your you. attention. Uh, Michael, do you want to come in for a couple of minutes, two, three minutes? Well, just to say one thing, to echo some of the points that Eric's made, to make, when you, when you listen to what Eric has just said, what strikes me is that here was a great situation where the Greek working class was prepared to take on a struggle against the mm. Troika. They were asked to vote on the question of accepting austerity in the memorandum. Everybody said they should vote to accept it. The Syriza government leadership was not campaigning to oppose it really. They just put it to the electorate. They expected it to be uh, lost, in other words, for the Greeks to accept uh, the Troika deal, and they rejected it resoundingly. The, so we have two things. We had an economic crisis of capitalism at a, at a critical point for the Greek capitalist economy, was on its knees. We had a working class that was prepared to continue the struggle against uh, anti-capitalist forces and the European Union if it blocked that. What was missing was a correct and strong and combative leadership, both on the part of Syriza and as what Eric has just described, even amongst other members of the left, who were all confused about what they should be doing, either opposing Syriza or coming up with different positions, which split the leadership of the working class. And in my view, from what Eric has just said, the working class was ahead mm -hmm. of its leadership in the terms of the, how this struggle could be conducted. Just think if there had been a combined communist socialist leadership with a clear pro program and, and the willingness and the ability to implement that program, how things would have been different. I mean, in ways, when, when Eric's books seem, you could say, oh, it's all about having a go at Varoufakis and complaining about Varoufakis being uh, negotiating with the, with the capitalists, both in, in Europe and so on and capitulating to them. Well, yes, but it is about that. But what the book is showing us is that at certain times, it's a crisis of leadership. It's a question of what the leaders do in, because they have all the other factors probably in favor of them for the first time uh, in a situation after years in Greece. And what they do in that situation is crucial. It makes all the difference between whether you succeed and go forward or whether you fail and end up where we are in 2020 now. 
in Greece. So in many ways, this book gives you an example of when the leadership, when individual leaders actually matter and their policies and how they fight really matters. Most of the time, maybe it doesn't matter because the objective conditions aren't right. But here was a situation where it did. Thank you very much. I'll take just a last round of people from the floor. I see, I'll take it, I'll just read out the order of comrades. Right? Theodore Ha, and then Yorgos, and then Susanna, and then Alan and Andreas again, and then we'll have a final uh, response from Michael and Eric. So, uh, Theodore Ha, do you want to, um, are you unmuted there? Do you want to come in? Can you, sorry, I don't have a good connection. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Ah, okay, thanks. Uh, so I think it is important as well um, to, to introspect on uh, Syriza's uh, organizational structure, uh, Syriza's failure to build uh, the mass party that has come to too little, and how that reflected on uh, the um, movement um, of Syriza um, from the social form of 2004 to the radical conference of 2012, where it was talk about uh, socialization of production, it was uh, placing presenters on uh, product on, on social relationships, on um, workers' control, nationalization, even of the banks, and what happened to the Thessaloniki Declaration of 2015, that uh, effectively uh, was laying the seeds of some sort of. Uh, uh, smart negotiations, the uh, UN, the AMIF, and the redistributions of the um, uh, results of these negotiations to the working class majority. And he wasn't talking about expropriation, uh, taxation, and uh, other measurements, and how that decimated to behind closed door efforts to outsmart the, uh, the creditors that was epitomized with Varoufakis, the February 2015 of the memorandum and then the total July 2015 capitulation. And I think that had to do a lot as well with the relationship that the movement had uh, with Syriza. Because um, although we had all these uh, very militant struggles between 2010 and 2012, a lot of sectoral and general strikes, a lot of solidarity networks, anti-fascist movements, a lot of squads, a lot of occupations, uh, around, I think, 2012-2013, there was some sort of uh, substantial redirection of expectation towards some sort of political change, and they were looking with the political to have a government of the left, with some good reason, but the movement that, I think, was a very heterogeneous movement and to have had to back an idea of what they expected of the Syriza government. And also the Syriza government, in a way, gained strength electorally. Its activist organization remained relatively very weak. And also there was a lot of talk of building a mass party. Um, this uh, talk um, um, at the end came to very little. And I think probably we should look at uh, how important was the role of the revolutionary left and the 13 components of Syriza inside and outside Syriza, and how important was the defeat of the dual membership of the federal structure of um, the recognition of um, the different components uh, of Syriza, as opposed to the plebiscite structure and what uh, Syriza uh, decimated to be. And I think that's an important thing as well. The means you use to, to achieve an end, they have to be consistent with the end and what type of party we want to build. Now, the second point I would like to mention is just very briefly about uh, of course, a big um, question in and out of Eurozone, in and out of Europe. But I think that was one of the major problems of the Greek far left outside Syriza is that it was fixated on Greek exit from the Euro and as its first line sort of difference with Syriza. And um, I thought the revolutionary left inside Syriza and the Turkish component have a more correct line, like the no sacrifice for the Euro, no drama space for mm. Europe but class versus class. And I think, I, I think that, was, that was important um, if we say that, uh, I think it is true that if we preempt, and that, that we saw the after effect where 
forces like uh, the popular front, the left component of uh, Syriza and Laos of Lafazanis, how they decimated to drachma national centric forces, uh, depriving of any class based understanding, not giving any agency to the working class, and collaborating even with open uh, nationalistic forces and being part of the Macedonia. Uh, ultra-right uh, demonstrations and uh, rallies. And I, th I think that's another thing to consider, that an exit from the EU or the Eurozone absent the class confrontation would have only led Greece, I think, further down to the road of nationalist uh, isolation, would have exacerbated rather than resolve austerity and uh, wealth inequalities. Um, because exit from the EU or Eurozone, I think it should not have been considered in its own and of its own as the way out of uh, austerity. A series of government which attempted confrontation with the creditors to carry through the program, even the limited program of the Thessaloniki Declaration under the agency of the working class majority and the uh, social movement that had been built. I think he should have been able to win uh, internationally solidarity and support uh, um, across the left. And that was a most uh, promising um, route, uh, okay. rather than the idea of a drag road socialism and uh, looking at Russia and China. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Yorgos? Hi, thanks. Yes. Um... I, I fully agree with what Eric said and Michael and Theodora and almost everything that Spiro said. Um, so I want to make, uh, I don't want to say what I agree on because I said it's everything. So I want to make a provocative comment uh, influenced a lot by, by Ian mentioning, mentioning Okde. So uh, I want uh, my provocative comment is the following. I think Syriza is the best thing that has happened in the Greek left over the last 30 years, probably. I think it's the best thing. I was a member of Syriza from the left uh, part of Syriza. And I think we lost for the reasons that Eric said. But so you will excuse me uh, with this because I'm not good uh, with regards to football. But it's like going to the finals and losing. So it will be interesting to see what got us to the finals. Why, uh, and also what other people are doing wrong, what other groups are doing wrong. And not only they've not went to the finals, but they're not even playing in the Premier League, which I understand it's the big uh, place where Greek teams get. So... I think it's, it would be interesting to see what Syriza did right to get there, apart from what we did wrong. And I fully agree with everything that he said with regards to, to drachma. And one of the things that was mentioned, and I've been thinking, actually, Eric said that uh, the Thessaloniki program was not anti-capitalist. But if that program got us there, maybe that was the right thing, right? And maybe even if uh, we didn't, given that we didn't have this uh, line of exiting the euro from the beginning, uh, probably this was the right thing because the parties who had this line actually were not able to enter the parliament. So I think, you know, maybe, we, maybe Syriza did lots of things correct. And one of the things that Syriza did correct, and this is a big difference, with the rest of the left, and it was actually one of the things that the far left within Syriza pushed for, is saying, okay, it's time to, to take power. We didn't do it in a good way, but we pushed for this. And uh, I think this kind of step, taking a step forward, was useful. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in fact, actually, the football analogy in politics is snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, I think is the term we've used. So, Susanna, Susanna, um, do you want to come in, Susanna? Yes, yes. Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Because my connection is pretty bad. No problem. Um, well, first of all, Eric, thank you very much uh, for your book. I read it and I appreciate it a lot. You know, the analysis, the level of analysis and the conclusions. I also uh, thank uh, Michael Roberts for his introduction. 
which I find also very illuminating. Now, um, I have a few, just, just a very simple question. Why, Eric, why did you wait five years to publish the book? That's my first question. And the second question is uh, what, you know, await, awaits us in the future, you know, uh, in Greece? Uh, what is the role that Syriza and uh, now Mera, so Varoufakis uh, party, are playing now in Greece? Mm. And uh, where can we find hope for Greece? Yeah, I think I think I think that's it. And then also, okay, if you like to comment on on Varoufakis, uh, you know, a campaign for the European elections and the fiasco uh, that followed it, uh, that would be interesting too. Thank you. Okay, Alan, and then Anders, and then we'll have Eric and uh, Michael to come back at the end. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm glad that Yorgos has just said what he said about Syriza and its historical significance. Um, there's another historical significance as well in that what produced Syriza, I, I think it'd be right to say, was the longest protracted high level period of class struggle in Europe, probably since Spain in the 1930s. I mean, it was utterly, utterly, uh, it was utterly dramatic what happened over a five year period um, in Greece. Um, and, and the political expression of that uh, in what was Syriza. And it's spectacularly sold out. I mean, there is no doubt about that. There was no analogies that could really fit, fit it. It was utterly spectacular. Um, I want to go back to what Mike said, a question Mike asked early on, about what about the currency? And, um, and, and Eric responded to that by saying, it's not about the currency, it's about the debt. I think that's a big mistake. A big mistake, because um, I, I I followed the period, and I don't think the issue was ever whether Syriza or Syriza government should have taken the initiative in leaving the eurozone. That wasn't it. The problem with the currency is that it was the chosen weapon of the European elites against the Greek working class. And they knew that, that you know, there was your communism in the background of, of Syriza and so on, and they knew it was the vulnerability of the Syriza government. And the issue, the issue, the issue was, and um, um, I, uh, um, is it that uh, Syros has said it earlier, that um, the, big, the, the big defeat and the big problem was the what was the, the the collapse of this, this, the uh, the Cyprus government in the face of the an ultimatum from the European elites that if they didn't uh, if they didn't um, uh, accept the package that they would be expelled from the euro and it was at that point that the, the whole thing collapsed and there was never there was never agreement on this really within the FI although I did actually think I had agreement with Eric Quite a, quite a bit of the time on the leadership of the FI. But because what I thought Eric and I agreed on at one point was that in those conditions, you couldn't confront the European elites unless you were prepared to be expelled, expelled from the euro. And, and they were never, Cyprus was never prepared to be expelled from the euro. I mean, Liam had it right. There ain't no preparation for expulsion from, from the euro. And so the whole thing, the whole thing collapsed once once that uh, once that ult ultimatum was levelled, and um, and it re it remains it remains um, remains a situation today. If in big confrontations inside the European Union, then you've got to be prepared to stand up to the threats that the elites will throw at you, and the biggest weapon is to exclude you from the eurozone. Uh, and uh, and so uh, I, I think that I think that was the that was the way round it came, and it was indeed, um, you know, a tumultuous and is historically important um, experience. 
Right, thanks. And there's briefly, you're, you're the last one before Eric and Michael. Okay, uh, very briefly, I mean, what was the sign that you were going to betray? It was that the exit from the Euro or European Union was not on the agenda. If you had that position, you could foresee that you would betray. And that's why I think Michael Roberts and Eric uh, are a bit wrong here, because the, the, uh, a consistent non-sectarian left, of course, had to point to that. Uh, the Syriza position would have been much stronger if they said, we don't want to leave the euro, but if you force us to do it, we will leave. And they would have sort of over the time prepared their own population for leaving, which turned out even with sort of sabotage of such an open uh, line, voted uh, for, uh, actually voted for, for leaving. I mean, okay, people move for simple demands, but the Bolsheviks said all power to the Soviets as opposed to the constitutional government all the way, all the way. So pointing to the alternative, saying that anyone who says or who are not willing to put the Eurozone and the EU on the agenda will become a betrayer. Of course, in a more pedagogical term, but we are common in Syria. We cannot sort of, this is not sort of uh, talking uh, to mass political pedo pedagogy. This is clarity. And we have never hidden that we should smash the state and, and we should smash the EU. And of course, I, I was always quarreling with, with OCTA, which is absolutely their way of doing po politics. It's absolutely different from my, I'm much closer to, to Alan when it comes to sort of that our demands should be leading, but in step uh, with what people sort of are conscious of their experience and so on. That's not the question. The question is that if you didn't say very early on that if you accept the Eurozone and the EU as a framework, you are going to betray and betray they did. And that's where the FI did not play its role, because we should have said that the EU is, of course, on the agenda. Everybody knew that. It was just Syriza who did not put, would not sort of start a discussion among the people on exiting the EU, a discussion which the Greek people was completely prepared for. Everybody knew that that was on the, on the agenda. And it's, it's in a way ridiculous, sort of strange to talk about the need for open diplomacy when you will not open a public discussion on the sort of the obvious alternative if you're not going to give in for the dictate. So I, I stick to my conclusion that the, 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 the really important and fundamental and first lesson is that it was the FI with its unclarity and we have still a majority who will, what will have now, happen now when the italic exit comes up we will, I will not sort of raise the question of Brexit, but we saw time and time after again, we sort of stumbled when it was important to be clear. Thanks. Okay, um, I'll take Michael first and then Eric to, to, to come back and close the meeting. Well, there were okay. lots of points made about a lot of discussion at the end and at the beginning on the currency. I again present my point that um, if you're campaigning to take Greece out of the cap control of capitalism, and you've got a party which at least ostensibly claims that that is its aim, and its leadership is supposed to be, uh, gets a mandate from the parliamentary uh, process and from the electorate to do that. And that is the basis of the campaign. Now, and that is what the, the Syriza leadership should have campaigned on, and should have not just on the question of uh, uh, supporting the policy, but campaigning amongst its own people in the labour movement, in the working class organisations to build support for that campaign and not engage, as uh, Eric has explained in his book, in secret and negotiations with adults to come up with some sort of uh, compromise, which uh, Varoufakis and others thought they could negotiate or claim they thought they could negotiate with the Troika. It should be a radical socialist campaign uh, mobilizing the labor movement against austerity and for a uh, change in Greece that will be irreversible and in the interests of the people. If in the process of that struggle, the issue of whether Greece will be able to maintain its position in the European Union and still have a currency which is called the Euro, then that will come up in the course of that battle. And then, as somebody else mentioned, over a period of months, I think it was Eric, you will be in the position to argue whether that was you could sustain the position of of the mandate that, that Syriza has and the government had uh, to carry out such a program 
in alliance with the other left, and whether you could, can, can, could maintain that with uh, Greece remaining in the euro. To put that up front as the issue that the Greek people should decide upon seemed to me totally wrong. And when those on the left who, after the defeat of Syriza, made that the issue, they got nowhere with the Greek electorate. You say, well, it was too late then. Well, I don't think so. I think that the issue was not whether we should be in, have a different currency or not, and whether the Greeks should leave the euro, but whether the, the Greek government or the Syriza government was going to carry out its program and bring about change towards socialism in, in Greece. That was the issue in front of Greek people, and it had a lot of support. That's the point. That's where the Greek people had the support. Anybody who thinks economically that issues between capitalism and socialism were decided by what currency you have, clearly don't understand that that's not the issue. You can have your Scottish pound, you can have your Greek drachma, but you're still facing capitalist opposition, both at home and internationally. The British pound goes down, not because it's separate, uh, not because it's, it, it's, uh, it's part of any European Union, which it isn't, it goes down because uh, finance capitalists and others break with the British pound and the pound goes down. That's what switches currencies, whether you're in a European Union or a currency union or not. That is not the fundamental issue that decides whether a, 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 an economy goes forward and whether government goes forward with it to change it. Uh, if you get blocked into that, then you're missing the fundamental argument of changing the capitalist system towards socialism. And that is the battle which Syriza could have led, but did not. Thank you, Michael. Um, Eric. Thank you. Another time uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Michael uh, just said uh, now. Uh, so I repeat, I was convinced since 2013 of the necessity of uh, the exit from the Eurozone, but uh, taking into account how the discussion was led in Greece and what was the Thessaloniki program on which the people voted for Syriza, I think that uh, the priorities in the concrete struggle uh, from January to July uh, was uh, focused on the question of the debt of the banks, of restoration of the uh, wages and uh, pension, etc. And uh, it would have been possible <clears throat> for the government to suspending the payment of the debt to make better the life of the people of Greece, to mobilize them, to convince the people of Europe to mobilize themselves to support the courage of the Greek government disobeying the treaties and the Troika. And it would have led to the exit of the Eurozone. Uh, in several months, but understand, understood by the majority of the people. And, and I agree, when the majority of the people, of the Greek people voted the 5th of July, a big proportion of this majority was prepared to the exit because everybody uh, defending the yes vote said, if you vote Oxy, if you vote no, you will be uh, thrown out of the Eurozone. Uh, leaders of the European Commission, the European Central Bank and the Greek medias uh, advocating for the yes vote. Uh, so as Michael said, the 5th of July, the conscience of the people was aware uh, of uh, the uh, orientation of, the, of Syriza. And Syriza 
not only capitulate, but the leadership of Syriza betrayed the people of Greece. It was a betrayal. It should be said very clearly. Uh, Susanna was asking me why, why I have waited five years. No, I, in fact, since the beginning, uh, I, I, I wrote a lot of articles uh, explaining my position uh, uh, from July uh, 2015. Just before July 2015, it was complicated because I was a coordinator of the the Truth Committee on the Debt. Uh, and Spiros was part of this uh, committee and uh, an active member uh, of this uh, Truth Committee on the Greek Debt. So I was in, in a discussion with uh, the, the comrades in Greece uh, about uh, what should be the orientation I I was I well, I was in discussion with the comrade of Okade, with the comrade uh, of other group of Antarsia like uh, the Nach and Aran also, and I was also uh, in discussion with uh, left platform inside uh, Syriza, mainly with Stratulis Dimitri Stratulis who who was the vice minister of pension uh, and also with uh, Costas Izijos, who was the vice minister of defense, uh, a very good comrade in this epoch, uh, Argentinian Greek uh, comrade, uh, and who was opposed to the agreement with Israel. And he was in a very difficult position as vice minister of, of defense in, in, in Greece. So really, I immediately from the 5th of July uh, explained publicly my criticism in, uh, in front of the position of Tsipras and the position of uh, Varoufakis. Um, I think that uh, the discussion around the book, and I thank uh, Resistant Book for convoking this discussion. Really, I, I think that uh, uh, the discussion around the lesson from the Greek experience are vital for the, the left in Europe. Also, of course, discussing uh, what happened in uh, Great Britain in the last five years, uh, and also what is uh, uh, happening in, in the Spanish state and, and Portugal. Uh, but in, in the case of Greece, we had a situation in which a leftist force was in the government, in, was in a position to, uh, confront really from a position of a government with all the legitimacy to, to lead the confrontation with the European Commission and the capitalist classes uh, in the direction of uh, socialism, as Michael uh, said. And um, just a, a last word, I think that the question of the program is also vital to have a clear program. And I think that uh, the left, in, including the radical left, is afraid of uh, really speaking of socialism, of expropriation of the capitalist class, which is the main question. It's not the question of the currency. The first question is expropriation of the capitalist class from the sectors like energy, banks, uh, uh, industry, and uh, 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 health sector in several countries of Europe. Uh, these are the priorities for an anti-capitalist force. And of course, in this struggle, the question of the currency 
is part of the 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 discussion and the option from the for the exit of the eurozone is a, a real option for the leftist forces at least in the periphery in the peripheral countries inside the eurozone thank you very much for this uh, discussion And uh, yes, thank you very much for Eric and Michael as well. I mean, I thought it was a fascinating discussion. Thanks everybody for um, staying for this long meeting. Um, uh, and as Eric was saying, this discussion was also relevant for us in, in Britain with um, Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. So yeah, just to remind everybody, if you haven't got the book, here it is. It's a very nice cover with Greece around, uh, surrounded by barbed wire, uh, Greece in 2015. So um, to get the book, just go to resistancebooks.org and um, you can pay online and you'll get it in a few days afterwards. Anyway, comrades, thank you very much again. again and also thanks again to Eric and Michael and um, keep in touch with Socialist Resistance and the CRDTM, the campaign for the cancellation of the debt. Um, if I got it right, yeah. Okay, uh, and um, see you again sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Good night.